Hi, we're going to be talking about violence and sexual violence in this series. Please take care while listening. I'm not sure exactly when the date is, but I think you get to give a victim statement. Is that correct? Or mm-hmm. And have you thought about that? If you Are you and the other survivors drafting those and sharing those? or I have my first page. Wrote it this morning. It'll, and I'm sure it'll change. In early July, I interviewed Chris Pedretti just days after Joseph James D'Angelo's hearing, where he pleaded guilty to a staggering number of charges, including murder and kidnapping. Chris appears in the HBO series. She was just 15 when she was attacked by D'Angelo. She and scores of other survivors were invited to read victim impact statements at his sentencing in August. We didn't end up keeping this in the episode, but during our conversation, she read us the first draft of her statement. Okay, well, I have a lot of scratch outs too. So I'm gonna jump around. So on December 17th, 1976, I was a 15-year-old normal kid. I loved What she wrote that morning, she'd go on to edit over and over again until reading it out loud in person, directly in front of D'Angelo himself. Here's Chris at the sentencing. It was one week away from Christmas. Our house was decorated, and I was having fun Christmas shopping for my friends and my family. My world was small, predictable, and safe. But by the time that night came to an end, my world changed forever. This is the official companion podcast of HBO's I'll Be Gone in the Dark. I'm your host, Nancy Miller. We're back with a short episode to update you on D'Angelo's sentencing and highlight some of the victim's impact statements. For three days... The survivors, their loved ones, and the family members and friends of the murder victims gathered in Sacramento to confront D'Angelo. Judge Michael Bowman presided over the court. D'Angelo, who was sitting in his wheelchair with a COVID-19 mask covering half of his face, was positioned right across from where 50 people would give statements. Chris spoke on the first day of impact statements. She detailed the night of the attack and the long-lasting trauma it caused. D'Angelo stared past her, never making eye contact with Chris. Do you feel any remorse for what you did to me? For the people whose lives you sadistically cut short? Or for the years of pain to your victims and their family? Do you finally feel humiliated? There was righteous anger in many of the speeches. This was every survivor's chance to finally get to say to D'Angelo what had been building inside them for the past 40 years. You will forever be known as a repulsive coward who hid behind a mask of evil. The devil can keep you company in your prison cell as he gnaws away at whatever soul you have left, at whatever life you have left. Survivor Linda O'Dell spoke soon after Chris, with Detective Carol Daly standing beside her. On day two, Survivor Jane Carson Sandler delivered her impact statement, accompanied by Bonnie Olson, D'Angelo's ex fiance And both Gay and Bob Hardwick took to the podium. The aftermath of this attack has been with me for 42 years. That's a very long life sentence for somebody who had done nothing to deserve such hatred and violence and desecration of my body. Gay spoke at length about the psychological and physical effects of PTSD, how her brain's chemicals have been forever altered. To illustrate the impact, she held up three pieces of blank paper, representing three lives. This life, paper number one, was never touched by Jody Angelo. She placed that piece of paper to the side and held up a second sheet. This life, paper number two, was murdered by Jody Angelo. Gay crumpled it up into a ball and set it down. She reached for the third piece of paper, which represented her life, her hopes and ambitions as a young 24-year-old. And then, as she recalled the night of D'Angelo's attack, she crumpled the paper into a ball and then smoothed it out again. This life, my life, would never again be like paper number one. 
My life was now full of creases and wrinkles. And no matter how hard I tried to iron them all away and press them and smooth the lines, make it function, my life would never be the same again. But Gay wasn't done yet. She took the time to explain the trauma caused not just by the attack, but by how the case was handled by the police and local officials back in the 1970s and since D'Angelo's arrest, which is when she found out that D'Angelo himself was once a police officer. To learn that D'Angelo, sworn to serve and protect, used his training and skill set to terrorize and rape and murder for years was staggering. Not only that, but this devious psychopath pursued a Bachelor of Arts degree in criminal justice, not to serve and protect others, but to enable him to be a very prolific, self-preserving criminal. She held up one final paper representing D'Angelo. It was blackened, shredded, and sealed in a Ziploc bag. This is opportunity that was turned into ugly choices. And when I was making this paper sculpture and I ran it through my paper shredder, doing that to Joe's life felt pretty good. The last day of impact statements was reserved for the family and friends of the 13 murder victims, including some of the people we got to know in All Be Gone in the Dark. Jennifer Carroll spoke. Her mother was Charlene Smith, and her stepfather was Lyman Smith. As did Drew with Hewn, who was Manuela with Hewn's brother-in-law. And finally, the day of D'Angelo's sentencing came. While his family, his ex-wife and daughters, did not show up at the sentencing, they prepared statements that were read by some of the attorneys. But most surprisingly, D'Angelo himself spoke. He stood up, easily, I might add, from his wheelchair and took off his mask. I've listened to all your statements, each one of them. And I'm truly sorry to everyone I've heard. Thank you, Your Honor. The Honorable Judge Michael Bowman requested that D'Angelo be positioned in front of him for the sentencing. Bowman typically doesn't make comments during this procedure, but he made an exception for this case. I know whatever words I say today will pale in comparison to the words the survivors have spoken. They need to be said. The fundamental principle of law that justice delayed is justice denied is no truer than in this case. But for the dogged persistence and perseverance of law enforcement, their survivors, their families, and citizen detectives, this case may have resolved, remained unsolved. There are many heroes like Carol Daly, Paul Holes, Michelle McNamara, and many heroes that I don't even know that brought this day here. And I have little doubt but for the tenacity and unwavering quest for justice exhibited by Sacramento District Attorney's Office, Emery Schubert, you may have escaped earthly justice altogether. Judge Bowman then took several minutes sentencing D'Angelo. His sentence includes over 20 life terms. This is the absolute maximum sentence the court is able to impose under the law. And while the court has no power to make a determination of where the defendant is imprisoned, the survivors have spoken clearly. The defendant deserves no mercy. We don't yet know which prison D'Angelo will spend the rest of his days, but many survivors shared their hopes for his conditions. Bob Hardwick laid out his, quote-unquote, fantasy sentencing, where D'Angelo would be attacked several times a week by masked inmates, doing unto D'Angelo what he had done to his victims. Chris Pedretti had another wish. D'Angelo deserves his sentence of life without parole in the most dark and lonely containment. If I had my way, D'Angelo would only be provided our impact statements as reading material for the rest of his days. Judge Bowman nodded along agreeing with Chris. Last week's statements were a special form of justice for the survivors and the victim's loved ones. It was personal, direct, and unfiltered. The takeaway, for me and anyone who was listening, I suspect, is awe at these women and their families and their tremendous courage and grace. Through this experience, I have learned how utterly important it is to be able to express out loud 
in some manner, whether verbally or in writing, that the shame and guilt belongs to the rapist, not the victim. I am personally relieved and honestly still in shock that we're ending this HBO docuseries and companion podcast with the killer behind bars. We're bringing this tragic, strange, but ultimately triumphant saga to a close. Except there's one last thing. Not about the Golden State Killer, but there's one last puzzle piece that the filmmakers wanted to resolve on Michelle McNamara's behalf. The unsolved murder of Kathy Lombardo. So, in a special episode, we'll speak with director-producer Elizabeth Wolf on just how far she and the documentary team got on this case. New interviews, clues, and insights into the 1984 death of Kathy Lombardo. Stay subscribed so you don't miss it. Until then. If you or someone you know has been sexually assaulted, you can get help by calling the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, or RAIN. You can call their 24-hour hotline at 800-656-HOPE-HOPE or visit hbo.com slash gone for more resources.